Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present the seventh lecture in my series of the selected gross pathology of the skin. And we're going to talk about diseases that are caused by various arthropods. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank those friends and colleagues who have provided me fantastic images over the years, which allow me to put these lectures together. Let's start with a common disease of dogs known as demodectic mange or demodicosis. All mammalian species have demodex mites living in their follicles and their sebaceous glands. And if you want to get a good look at your own demodex mite, just rub your eyebrow over a glass slide. Put that under the microscope and I'll bet you see them. Their obligate parasites with their entire life cycle spent on the host. There are two forms of demonicosis. Localized forms, which generally one or two patches, that most immunocompetent animals can take care of because of their cell-mediated immunity as well as their innate immunity cycle. It appears that innate immunity works against uh, flourishing of the mites because receptors on keratinocytes in the hair follicles recognize mite chitin and elicit the innate immune response without inducing a profound immune response. Generalized demodicosis, as we see here, is often seen in animals with concurrent disease or in poor condition, such as animals who are cachectic, animals that are immunosuppressed, or have other diseases such as hormonal problems like hypothyroidism. There's probably a genetic component of certain breeds, such as Staffordshire Terriers and Sharpay seem to be predisposed to generalized demodicosis. In demodicosis, because of the presence of the mite, there is an immune response that is directed against the hair follicles, causing them to lose their hair shaft. But it's not considered a really pruritic disease, as is sarcoptic mange, which we'll talk about in a minute. Most of these areas of redness seen on this animal are probably secondary bacterial infections. As I said, everybody has demodex mites. And it's usually an alopecic disease without a lot of pruritus. Here is demodicosis in a guinea pig. And it's also a very common lesion in old hamsters. Age and concurrent adrenocortical lesions, which put the animals into a cushionoid state, probably predispose these animals to generalized demodicosis as a result of infection by Demodex erratus and Demodex crisetti, which you may see shared with gerbils or guinea pigs as well. Wild animals aren't spared as well. As we said, a lot of mammalian species have them. Here's a young white-tailed deer from an article on VetPath written by Dr. Kevin Keel, uh, identifying some common diseases in deer. And you can see that similar alopecia, a little bit of crusting, and a nice microscopic representation of the demodex mites in the hair follicle. And white-tailed deer as well as a number of other ruminant species like goats, you can see so many uh, demodex mites within the hair follicle that they get swollen and they are grossly visible in cut sections of the skin from these animals. Well, let's move on from the alopecic, non paritic every host has its own and they rarely jump uh, hosts, demodectic mange to the pruritic, almost everybody gets it, they can jump hosts uh, and you can catch this disease, sarcoptic mange. The term sarcoptic mange uh, or sarcoptic mites represent a different type of mite that are seen in many animal species. They live in the epidermis. They cause tremendous crusting and the presence of their secretions and eggs and excreta cause tremendous pruritus as a result of a combined type 1 and type 4 
hypersensitivity. So these animals often show tremendous pruritus. Sarcoptic mange um, has been identified in over 350 different types of mammals. It's commonly seen in wild mammals, as we will see shortly. And in most food species, and in most countries, sarcoptic mange is a reportable disease. In affected animal, the lesions often hit the sparsely haired parts of the body first, including the ears, the lateral elbows, the ventral thorax, and the abdomen. The crusts that are associated with the presence of the mites in all stages, both sexes, um, are often ripped off shortly because of the tremendous pruritus. So these are generally red hemorrhagic scabbed over lesions. Like demodectic mange, these animals are often in a poor state of nutrition or immunosuppressed. One of the commonly affected species that has its own subtype, Sarcoptes scabii variant suis, is the pig. Young animals, especially piglets, are infected early on by infected sows. You can see the characteristic grayish white crusts and then the areas of pruritus and excoriation. In pigs, this usually starts at the front of the animal, especially on the inner surface of the ear. From this site, they spread out over the body, tail, and legs. As I often say, the skin diseases of pigs can be divided into those that start at the front and those that start at the back. Sarcoptic mange is usually one that starts at the front. And these animals frequently rub and scratch. Um, and you can see if they're kept in metal pens, oftentimes the metal is polished to a very high sheen because they're constantly rubbing and scratching. And the pruritus is one of the other things that helps you differentiate sarcoptic mange from many of the other non-pruritic skin diseases of pigs. While sarcoptic mange is not going to kill uh, affected animals. Food animal production is markedly impacted because in pigs you have a decreased rate of growth. In cattle you would have decreased rate of growth as well as decreased milk production. Um, even the sows will produce smaller litters when sarcoptic mange is in the herd. Here's a fantastic picture of scabies in a mini pig. Remember that scabies is transmitted by direct contact. So animals that live outdoor may come in contact either with other animals carrying scabies. Um, and foxes are a, a commonly affected species or simply fomites in which other animals with scabies might have rubbed up against. Here's a fantastic cross-section of skin. This appears to be from an ox, which shows you the tremendous thickening of the epidermis and crusting, which sort of clogs the, uh, the hair together, seen in an animal with sarcoptic mange. As I mentioned earlier, red foxes are very commonly seen to be uh, sort of underweight, malnourished, and have a poor hair coat and scabby all over. Uh, in certain parts of the country, especially in Maryland where I live, um, most of the red foxes that you will see have sarcoptic mange. Here's an elk with sarcoptic mange. It's rubbed much of the uh, hair of its body off in, in affected areas. And then I'm gonna move on to lab animals. Now you'll, people will use the term sarcoptid mites. These are mites that are not true sarcoptes scabii mites. They're related mites 
and they share a similar home within the crusting epidermis. So people call those sarcoptic mites, sarcoptid mites. They all have sort of the same behavior um, and they cause tremendous pruritus, the hypersensitivity that we mentioned before. Uh, the sarcoptid mite of the, uh, of the guinea pig is Trixacaris cavii. And like sarcoptes, will cause intense pruritus and scratching. Look at the wild look in this animal's eye. If you let it go, it's gonna start scratching and it might just absolutely run up and run headlong into the wall. In infection with sarcoptes or the other sarcoptid mites, you may actually see changes in the blood work. Um, you could see uh, heterophilia, monocytosis, eosinophilia, some basophilia. So these severe infections may actually cause clinical pathologic changes. You can tell that uh, arthropod-based disease is severe when it causes changes in the peripheral blood. Here's another sarcoptid mite, which is not uh, uh, sarcoptes, but this is a related, related mite that we will see in cats and wildcats, including bobcats and lynx. And this is Notoedris cati. Notoedris cati also lives in the stratum corneum. It causes tremendous uh, crusting and pruritus, usually starts around the ears of the cats. And uh, you will see it in the face and work its way back. You'll often also see it on the base of the tail in early infections because cats often sleep curled up with their face on their tail. And it's a good place to find additional lesions in these animals. If you were to tell me this was sarcoptic mange, I probably couldn't argue with you, especially if this was a feral cat. It's been identified in uh, mountain lions uh, as well. And in Hawaii, it's been identified in mongoose or mongooses or mongeese. It's a great picture by Janae O'Donnie showing the uh, very characteristic pattern of uh, alopecia and crusting on the head and the rear of this mongoose, an invasive species which really shouldn't belong in Hawaii. Another genus of mite that causes severe problems in a number of species are the Seroptes mite. Unlike Sarcoptes, um, they don't burrow in the skin, they, but they spend their entire lifetime on the skin, living on lipids from the stratum corneum, and they also cause an intensely pruritic dermatitis. Um, you can see the disease is called cattle scab, and it's a reportable disease in uh, several countries, and you can also see this uh, similar disease in sheep and horses, and goats as well. They often have a significant secondary bacterial infection and infected calves will have significant uh, blood changes including anemia, lymphopenia, and neutropenia. The pruritus is also a combination of type 1 and type 4 hypersensitivity and these animals are absolutely miserable. They have a marked decrease in weight gain and milk production and you can occasionally see mortality in these cases. Here's another bad looking seroptic uh, infection uh, called sheep scab covering the scrotum of this sheep. Uh, a reportable disease again in many countries we haven't seen this in the United States since the 1970s but a number of European countries still have it. You have large scaly crusty lesions on the woolly parts of the body and these animals are continually biting and scratching at these uh, left untreated and, and most of these mites are very easily treated with ivermectin but left untreated uh, these animals will eventually become anemic and emaciated there's a seroptic mange which causes severe disease in the ears, and many of these infections seem to start in the ears, I'm not sure why, but uh, one that almost stays exclusively in the ears of rabbits is Seroptes cuniculi. Once again, a non-burrowing, 
mite, which spends its entire life on the host. So when you take a scraping of this, um, you're going to see adults, nymphs, and eggs. It's extremely pruritic, often secondary, bacterially infected. These smell to high heaven, and these mites often have a three-week life cycle. The, the males die right after mating. The females spend three to four weeks, uh, lay all their eggs, and die as well. Just for fun, here's what sarcoptic mange looks like. It's on the outside of the ear. This animal probably was kept outdoors. And you have the same crusting and pruritus that you would see with sarcoptic mange. If it's on the inside of the ear and it looks like cornflakes, then it's seroptes. Outside of the ear and other parts of the animal, then it's probably sarcoptes. Sarcoptes burrows, sarcoptes doesn't burrow, but they both cause tremendous pruritus. There is a second uh, disease caused by mites and cattle, which is not usually a reportable disease. It causes more mild lesions, usually seen in and around the uh, uh, dairy cows in winter. And this is known as Coreoptic mange or Coreoptes bovis. It causes a thickening and scabbing generally around the base of the tail, but the infection, if untreated, may spread to the udder, the scrotum, and the forelimbs. Doesn't cause changes in the blood work, not severe disease, and not reportable, like cattle scab or seroptic mange in cattle. Let's look at a couple of other uh, types of mange, and, and probably every Mammalian species will have some form of mange or mice that live in the follicles, um, but we don't hear about many of these. This is one that used to be seen in captive Asian macaques. This is Sorogates circopithesi or Sorogates simplex, which cause um, a somewhat pruritic alopecia crusting lesion, but this is probably historic in lab animals. Mange is a very easy thing to get rid of since the advent of ivermectin. Here's a rabbit with alopecia, a little bit of silvery crusting, and if you looked really closely, you would see some of these little white pieces move around. Uh, this is Caliatella parasitivorax. Um, Caliatellosis in uh, has been seen in rabbits, it's seen in dogs, rarely in cats, and it's been referred to as walking dandruff. It does not cause the hypersensitivity and pruritus that other species of mites will do. Chylatiella parasitivorax, walking dandruff. Ear mites. Ear mites are another form of, of mite that generally lives in the ears of this being a ferret. They almost always have it. You can see it in dogs and cats, and it's characterized by the production of a particularly dark black copious wax within the ears, which is stimulated by the irritation and the presence of the Otodectes mite, Otodectes cynotus. Don't confuse this one with Notoedres can I? They both, like many mites, like to affect the ears. This one just causes a lot of black wax. Whenever you get a ferret, generally the first thing you do is you go and you clean the ears out real well and you put a little of ivermectin in it because especially when you get them from the pet store um, or from a shelter, they often will have a good case of ear mites, but it usually doesn't cause much of any problem at all. Another sarcoptid mite, meaning that it lives uh, its entire life cycle and burrows within the epithelium, causing tremendous crusting, are nematocoptes. There are two major types of nematocoptes. Now, one is nematocoptes mutans, which affects chickens, the non-feathered parts of chickens. So you'll see them on the face and the, uh, and the feet, occasionally the comb and the waddles, and there is Nematocoptes pili, which affects cytosines. Once again, the feet, the face, 
And both of these are burrowing parasites. Nematocoptes uh, pili especially has the ability actually to burrow into the beak, causing and the burrows cause weakening of the beak, which may crack and break off. You'll see the lesions covering the sear on the face, sometimes around the eyes, but very classically on the feet in parakeets and chickens. Nematocoptes mutans in the chicken, Nematocoptes pili in small cytosine birds. Feather mites. In poultry, there are two main types of feather mites. The northern fowl mite is Ornithonissus sylviarum, and the red chicken mite, or the red roost mite, is Dermanissus galenae. And they cause significant problems economically with chickens. The, they're most often seen, seen in young layers. They live in the roost box, especially the red chicken mites, and they get on the animals and they feed on blood. So they have this sort of dark reddish uh, appearance. You can see them in large clusters on, fair, on the feathers around the vent of animals. And in addition to decreased egg production, heavy infections are going to cause uh, anemia. Usually there's a lot of dark stained feathers around the vent as a result of the accumulation of the mites, the scabs that they leave and that the animals uh, cause because of pruritus, and fecal material. Here's another picture of these presence of these red mites throughout the body. They often, uh, the infections are often worse during cold months of the year because of the close contact of the birds during the period, and this is where these infections can spread throughout a house. Another arthropod parasite that lives on chickens and looks a lot like those uh, northern fowl mites is the blood-sucking parasite uh, Argus persicus, the fowl tick. And in addition to causing uh, discomfort, causing anemia, it also is a reservoir for the spirochete and cause of agent of avian spirochetosis, Borrelia and Serina. Let's move on to lice. Lice is often seen in animals that are malnourished, overcrowded, unthrifty, including people. Um, this is a picture of the uh, very down deep, close to the skin of a cow. And this particular louse has a thick head. Lice come in two basic flavors. The sucking lice, which live on uh, tissue fluids and blood, and the biting louse, which lives on dandruff and, and uh, uh, bits of material from the skin. Sucking lice may cause anemia. Biting lice don't cause anything except a bit of an itch. Um, you can usually tell the difference because the biting lice have wider heads and big jaws for chewing on a desiccated piece of skin. And the, uh, the head of the biting louse generally has a pointy uh, end for sticking into the skin and sucking tissue fluids. This louse, this biting louse of cattle is known as Bovicola bovis or Damalinia bovis or the red louse. It's the most common uh, cattle louse. It's usually seen in animals most often in the winter and early spring because that's when the hair of the host is the longest. Biting lice usually can live off of the host for longer than sucking lice because they don't require blood males. Now, one of the problems that we see, especially with the sucking lice in uh, various animal species, is because they take blood males, they transmit a number of diseases. In cattle, sucking lice have been incriminated in the transmission of anaplasmosis. It's 
another important sucking louse is one that has historically be, been seen in pigs. Here are some that have taken a blood meal. They're on the inside of the ear of the pig. And that is, this is Hematopinus suis. Um, this has been known to transmit the blood parasite Epirithrozoan suis. If they've taken a blood meal, they're sort of reddish. If they have not taken a blood meal, they're sort of whitish colored. Um, they feed on, feed on a frequent basis. They will cause irritation and the animals will rub and polish everything in their, uh, in their environs, just like I mentioned earlier with sarcoptic mange. As lice on pigs don't have, you know, the ability to penetrate very thick parts of the skin. You usually see them in the parts of the pig where the skin is the thinnest. So you'll see them on the, on the inside the ear, on the neck, and the inner side of the legs as well. Most animal species have a number of louse species. Here are two that are seen in guinea pigs. And guinea pigs, you'll often have, uh, and other rodents, you can often have a pretty good infection of lice without showing any clinical signs. Uh, here on both sides, these are both biting lice. This is Glyricola, Glyricola porcelli and Chiropa savalis on this side. And you often see them in at autopsy because as the animal's body cools, they're attracted to the light, often the lights of the autopsy room and the camera table. So they will, you won't see them at the beginning of the autopsy, but you'll start to see them, see them at the end of the autopsy as the animal's body starts to cool out. Mice have them too. We don't see them much anymore. They're very uncommon laboratory mice. You can see them in mice from pet stores or wild mice, polyplax serrata is uh, a common genus and it used to be the vector of Epirithrozoan coccoides, a blood parasite of mice. Oh, here's a nice picture of a dead guinea pig, which all of a sudden had all of this lice at the end of its hair before the autopsy was started. Uh, lice and non-human primates are very uncommon because of their grooming behavior. We've all seen uh, primates grooming each other and then they grab, they find something, they grab a louse and they stick it in their mouth. Well, that's sort of the predilection of, uh, of monkeys. Anything that fits in their mouth eventually goes in their mouth. Um, this is uh, probably an animal. This is a young animal. It's probably caged by itself, hopefully not for one of those psychi psychiatric experiments where they give it a choice of a blanket or a bottle. Um, and this is Pedicinus longiceps, but not something that you would expect in non-human primates. Poultry have lice too. Great picture by Guillermo Romoldi of the, uh, uh, the louse, the chicken louse, Manicanthus straminius. You see lice and you see mites more often in animals and chickens that have a longer lifespan. Um, usually it's in your broiler breeders or your laying hens. Um, not so much in your typical broilers that are raised up and go to market within eight or ten weeks. Okay, moving on from the lice. Um, let's go to the bugs, and uh, this is a great picture of horn flies, and the horn fly is considered one of the most economically devastating pests of the beef cattle industry, which causes, just by irritating the animals, um, causes annual losses of between $700 million and $1 billion in the U.S., every year and then another 100 million is spent annually on insecticides to control infestation cattle expend a great amount of energy 
uh, assuming defensive positions and whipping their tail and trying to get away from these flies. So it results in elevated heart rates and respiratory rates, reduced grazing time, decreased feed efficiency. You can imagine how it impacts. Uh, these animals also will spread certain uh, helminth parasites like we've talked about, Stefano filaria stylesi is spread by the horn fly on the underside of the animal near the umbilicus. The average horn fly takes between 25 and 40 blood meals per day. So they're very active and they really can cause a lot of problems in a beef production where they're not controlled. Now, if we're not talking about the adult flies, we're going to talk about their offspring. Uh, larva or bots, there are a number of them can, that can cause problems, but one that particularly causes problems in the skin of cattle are the bots of Hypoderma bovis or Hypoderma lineatum. These two, uh, these two flies will lay their eggs on the uh, hair of cattle, particularly on the legs and lower body. These eggs hatch out in the first stage larva, travel to the base of the hair shaft, and penetrate the skin. They spend a long time burrowing through the animal, months exactly, and they migrate along fascial planes, leaving tracks of, of green gelatinous material, which is known as uh, butcher's jelly. Um, the, the larva of Hypoderma bovis, um, which is also known as the gadfly, I'll get back to that in just a second, but they, the larva of the Hypoderma bovis overwinter in the epidural fat, while the Hypoderma lineatum um, overwinter in the esophageal submucosa. The next year, they continue their migration, and they end up as large larva or bots uh, in the subcutis. And they will burrow and they will uh, make a hole in the hide in which they put their spiracle, which is the hind end of these animals, which they breathe through. And you can see how this is going to be uh, devastating to the hide itself. So the hide is worthless because it's full of these little holes. And then in areas which they, where they have, the, have migrated, those have to be trimmed off any type of meat. So they can do a lot of damage. Now, hyper, the adult of Hypoderma bovis can also cause problems um, due to decreased uh, weight gain and just bothering the animals because it's known as the gadfly. And when it flies, it has this buzzing noise. So the cattle know that uh, the, the, the fly is around and they run from it. They will f try to get in the middle of a group of cow and it, not as bigger problem is horn flies, but certainly in affected areas of the country. Um, cattle don't like the presence of the adult flies. Um, we were taught in veterinary school that you could take a Coke bottle and you could put it over the top and you could pop these. You, by pushing down on it real fast, you would be able to pop these bots out of the hole, through the hole into the Coke bottle. I never tried it because uh, the other warning was if you miss and you crush it, then the animal will drop of anaphylaxis. So I guess discretion is the better part of valor, so I never tried that trick. Hypoderma bovis or Hypoderma lineatum. You can see them in other ruminants. Um, I believe this was a sheep. Other bots that you'll see commonly is or the Cuterebra family. We've talked about that in cats with lesions in the brain. Well, this is a fly which will leave here two uh, matching uh, large bots. It's about the size of the bots. You often will see them in uh, squirrels. You'll see them in rodents. Um, the flies will find a wound and they will lay eggs in the wound and they will develop into these large uh, bots which are called wolves. You can see them in uh, uh, cats. I've actually cut them out of a number of dogs back when I was in practice. So Cuterebra emasculator is the most common species. And as we said before, what they will do is if in cats, uh, in certain parts of the country during the late summer and early fall, you'll see these animals, the, the fly will actually lay the, the egg 
uh, on the nose and the larva will migrate up the nose and the sinuses and may pass through the cribriform plate. Uh, crawling around in the cranium of affected cats, they get a very characteristic response um, which results in ischemia of the parts of the brain which uh, are, are supplied by the middle cerebral artery. And so they'll get these large necrotizing lesions and if they have one, they'll circle to that side. If they have two, they just don't know what they're doing. Um, Cuterebra, a masculator, mostly causing um, temporary problems in animals, but in those cats, they have significant issues. Another larval of a fly is something that I had to deal with when I worked in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. We don't have it in this country. I'm not sure where this picture was taken by Dr. John King, but this is the skin of a pig, and what you see is a large hole in which there is a mass of the larva of Cochleomaya hominivorax, the screw worm fly. And I remember we used to see this all the time in Cuba. They also will go for moisture or a wound. So um, the, the rule of thumb is anything, basically they, they cause these gigantic holes and there are masses of these and the animals will become septic pretty quickly if they're smaller than a Rottweiler. I used to have to take them out of cats and I was very unsuccessful in keeping them alive because they'd go septic. Um, dogs, big dogs, you could you could clean them out and then you would cut away the tissue and it'd be almost a fist-sized hole in these animals that they would have to recover from. Um, I used to have to take them out of the sheaths of, of horses and so I would put my put uh, soap or lubricant in my uh, on my hand and I reach up in the sheaths and they're always way in the back of the sheath of a horse and then you would just feel around you pull them and they, they would be biting you when while uh, uh, you were taking them out. It was a nightmare. And that's why we don't want to have, it's just a tremendous economic impact uh, in the countries that have this. So the U.S. has spent a tremendous amount of money re releasing uh, sterilized adults, which mate with other ones, and of course they don't produce any offspring. So these are screw worms, and I hope for the practitioners out there to watch this, you never have to encounter this particular parasite. Okay, just a couple of other um, parasites, and we'll wind this one up. Uh, ticks, these are the soft-shelled or spinose ear ticks um, that affect a number of production species. The, the genus is Otobius magnini, and they get into the ears, and they really cause a lot of problems in ruminants and horses and pigs and rarely small animals. They cause uh, a bacterial otitis externa, and rarely they would go through the uh, eardrum and cause otitis media. Um, these are uh, nymphs. Only the, the larvae and the nymphs are parasitic. The uh, adults uh, live off of the, uh, off of the, the host. Um, animals that are infected with these in large numbers, um, you can see high sensitivity. They don't like their ears touched. They're always shaking and rubbing their heads um, and cause their ears to become raw. Another tick that will cause significant problems, especially in uh, moose, is Dermacenter albopictus. And this, the condition in uh, the moose is called ghost moose because they'll lose their hair, their skin will be sort of a, a very whitish gray color underneath. And the presence of large numbers of these ticks not only cause alopecia, but they cause tremendous uh, loss in condition. The animals will become cachectic. Ghost moose due to dermacenter albopictus. Well, this is another insect-related disease and a very angry-looking cat with a uh, old, raw ulcerated nose. And this is mosquito bite hypersensitivity in cats. This is generally affects uh, the nasal planum, the periocular, and the uh, ears of cats, as we see here, and the pinna. And it is a type 1 hypersensitivity. If you take a biopsy of these areas, you'll see a mixed 
uh, dermatitis with a large number of eosinophils. So it's, sort of, it's usually a crusting. This one's rather ulcerative, but crusting. Um, also known as a papulocrustular dermatitis in affected cats. And our last slide in this particular lecture is really not an arthropod, but I'm not going to have a lecture for crustacean-related diseases. Um, what we're seeing here are the end product of the female anchor worm, and it's a genus of parasitic copepods or crustaceans, which uh, after mating, the females will burrow into the flesh of fish, and they have a little hook. That's why they're called anchor worms. And they will transform into this unsegmented worm-like parasite. Um, they do irritate the, uh, uh, the fish, resulting in their frequent rubbing on stuff to try and dislodge the worms. They will become lethargic, have uh, breathing difficulties. Uh, this is Lernia species in the fish. Okay, well that brings us to the end of this lecture on arthropod-based diseases of the skin. We see a lot of them in domestic species. Most systems have one or two. The skin is where most of them end up. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I wish you uh, a wonderful day, terrific health, and we'll see you back for lecture eight, which is gonna be on the various immune-mediated diseases of skin, primarily, in our companion animals. Until then, have a great day.